you've probably noticed that it's hot this week in Oregon. I think we've all noticed. Uh, scientists say that extreme weather events, uh, including ice storms in the winter, monsoon-style rainstorms in the spring, and heat waves like this in the summer are only becoming more common and more extreme. Uh, and we know that Oregon's not immune to that. At the same time, Oregonians have been facing some of the highest prices at the pump in the country this summer. Uh, and the state's power consumption has increased significantly over the past decade. Uh, as governor, what would you do to address climate change while also making sure that we're addressing Oregonians' energy needs? Yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, climate continues to have an impact on our everyday lives. Uh, we have felt that with multiple years of drought in, in Oregon, and, and this is an important issue. So there are a couple of things that I, that I think are important to state on this one. Oregon continues to be a leader on climate. Uh, we have some of the cleanest energy sources in the nation. Uh, we have completely transitioned off of coal. We have hydropower, solar, wind. All of these things exist within our state. The challenge that we're going to have and that the next governor will have is how to protect access to reliable, affordable energy, whether or not it's at the gas pump, which we can do something about that with gas taxes and some of the regulatory environment, some of the issues that we face when it comes to our energy, but also in protecting our dams. Uh, right now there's a conversation going on uh, between governors um, and stakeholders about whether or not to remove dams. Now, I want to be clear on this point in particular. We need to continue to protect access to, uh, to no to, um, to no carbon hydropower. So we're not talking low carbon, we're talking no carbon emission hydropower, and it needs to continue to be a part of our mix here in the state of Oregon. So I would continue to support the programs that we have related to climate action, and I would tear up the governor's executive order on, on climate, which she chose to adopt after cap and trade, California style cap and trade did not move through the legislative process. If that would have passed, we would see $3 more at a minimum at the gas pump today we would see 30% higher costs in, to heat and cool your home today. That was the wrong concept, it was the wrong idea. Thank you. Okay, next in order is uh, Speaker Kotak. Thank you for the question, Mark. Climate change is real, Oregonians are feeling it, and it is a top priority for Oregon voters this fall. As someone who believes, as a woman of faith, that we have to take care of this world that we've been given, we have a lot of work to do. And in addition to trying to keep the problem from getting worse, we have to mitigate the issues and help our communities be resilient because there are droughts and wildfires and, and adverse weather effects that are killing people. So we have to do both. We have to keep our community safe and address climate change. I worked hard last year to pass 100% clean electricity by 2040. It is going to take oversight to make sure we can move to offshore wind and more storage and maintaining hydro with all the things that will get us to the clean electricity standard by 2040. And it's gonna take work. It's a transition and we're all gonna to have to work hard. One of the things that I did support as Speaker of the House was a change at the Public Utility Commission. So the Public Utility Commission could take into account rates and how they would affect low income Oregonians, low income rate payers. I'm not sure if my colleagues voted for that, but I certainly did, because in this transition, we have to protect our most vulnerable Oregonians, our most vulnerable communities, and still make the transition. And when it comes to the executive orders, those executive orders were put in place because Leader Drazen led a Republican walkout for us to take a market-driven approach to address carbon emissions in our state. Those executive orders are reasonably moving us forward while also protecting our communities, and they should stay in place. Okay. Climate change is real, and Oregon has to do its share to lower our carbon footprint. But I reject the premise that the progressive bills that were brought forward, that the economic burden should fall on hardworking Oregonians. Um, it is not the responsibility of the blue-collar guys that I used to represent in the Senate to pay for how expensive the progressive agenda is to moderate climate change. I, I think that the biggest thing we can do to mitigate climate change is what I've already spoken to, and that's not let the place burn down every year. The amount of particulate and carbon that goes into the air from conflagration is absolutely unacceptable. We need to manage our forests and, re and recognize that that's a place where carbon is sequestered, that they help cool the environment. We have to manage our forests better. The other thing that we need to be conscious of is uh, in implementing alternate uh, energy sources. The speaker just talked about offshore wind. I want to make sure that that offshore wind doesn't come at the, expenses of, uh, at the expense of fishermen. 
Uh, I want us to keep our damn hands off the dams. I agree with, uh, with uh, uh, Christine that clean, non-carbon hydropower is a boon to us, and to take out those dams would cost an enormous amount of money. Uh, the executive orders, uh, I believe, are a complete usurpation of the legislative process. What the governor could not get through the people's branch of government, the legislature, she imposed through executive order. The rule writing has been excessive, and I think the outcome will be much higher okay. prices for Oregonians struggling with inflation. Thank you, Senator Johnson. So now we're, we're back to the start of the panel. Everyone got a sh shot at that, right? I'm going to respond, actually, to Senator Kotek briefly. Okay. Thank you. I just want to say this very briefly about the need for uh, checks and balances in Salem. The cap-and-trade proposal that uh, Senator Johnson just referenced absolutely pushed all of the costs, all of the harm, all of, all of the pressure to respond to climate onto everyday working Oregonians. And when we were just talking about the rural-urban divide, people that drive further would face a higher burden for this. The need to lead a Republican effort to deny quorum on this was simply because of the intensity of single party majority control, their determination that no matter what this bill did to anybody, they were going to pass it no matter what. The need to stand in the gap was essential and critical, and we used that tool because we had no other options after making 100 amendment proposals that were rejected by the single okay. party control. Hang on one second. Mark, do you want to rephrase for a follow-up question and give them each another 60 seconds? Ask them specifically about uh, what they're talking about now. We're, we could give them each 60 seconds if you want to, to talk about this a little bit more. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, 60 seconds on a cap and trade proposal. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, what is that something that the candidates here could find a way to support a cap and trade program? Yes. That's bipartisan. Go ahead. Thank you. So the question about whether or not the cap and trade uh, proposal, which was bipartisan, could have received Republican support, the answer to that could have been yes. Uh, the proposals that came out of the members of that committee that worked very hard to come to compromise on that, all of them were rejected and not supported. And the, and the legislation got more and more onerous. And frankly, it became more and more a, a, an issue that was kicked off to rulemaking, which created less certainty about what the costs would have been, frankly, what the revenues would have raised, and what the increase in growth of government would have been. In the end, it was an absolute monstrosity of a bill. But there was an opportunity for compromise there. Senator Johnson, 60 more, and then uh, Speaker Kotak. Thank you. I would agree with the premise that there was not a lot of flexibility in offering amendments to that bill. But I would like to point out that while uh, uh, Christine was in Reno poolside, I was on the Senate floor standing up to my party fighting that bill. It's a lot harder to be in the building fighting for a good outcome than it is to flee the building. Uh, that bill was uh, a monstrosity at the end, and it would have crippled rural economies and hurt working people substantially. Speaker Kotak. So first I'm going to start with the positive that my opponents believe in climate change and know that we need to do something. What I'm not hearing is solutions. What I'm hearing is, no, that was terrible. No, we can't do that. No, that doesn't work. There must be solutions on the table. And as someone who sat in rooms, particularly with Leader Drazen, no solutions were laid on the table. It's just we don't like it. And when you have a challenge as big as climate change, and you've gone through a two-year process to develop a piece of legislation that is market-driven and would benefit many parts, particularly rural parts of our state, to be part of the transition to renewable energy and to have that fail, That was just saying to Oregonians, I'm going to throw in the towel, even know how big the deal is. And that was wrong. Climate change is real, and we need to have solutions, and I'm the only one up here who's going to make that happen. 